uh, yes, the slices yesterday uh, on the on the website. I, I think I, I posted there as well. Uh, so we are going to focus uh, only in one dimension. It's basically we are going to describe uh, this equation is described the heat transfer uh, along a, a rod. Imagine like you have a, a metal rod, right? You have a metal rod, and basically you want to know what is the temperature on every single point, given the some initial condition and some boundary conditions. Okay. And the diffusion equation is basically, as I said. Uh, you, 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 you see that the, the change in temperature in time on a particular point of this rod, right, on a particular point of this rod is going to be proportional on how much that point deviates from the average around it. So that's what the Laplace is, uh, or the second derivative in space is telling us. If the, the, the points around that point is too hot or too cold, so basically the change in, in the temperature with, with respect to time is gonna be large and the temperature will just uh, uh, decay or, or go towards some sort of average around, that temp around that, those points. In order to do this, we need to approximate those derivatives uh, in a grid point, right? So on a rod on the, on the real world or the, the world of mathematics, right? Or continuous mathematics, we have infinite points along the rod. Right, but on the computer we cannot compute uh, infinite points because each point on the computer needs to be represented uh, in memory, and each point takes uh, each uh, double precision points, for example, each floating point takes uh, uh, eight bytes, right, on the computer. So it takes memory. It cannot have infinite number of points. So what we usually do, we do what is called a discretization. We just partition this uh, rod in very small uh, uh, intervals, right? Which we can, and then on, on each interval, on each, on the center of each interval, we, we have a point that we call a grid point and the set of all these points is called a, a grid, okay? So, and basically what you're looking for is the temperature and every single point along the rod. So every single point represents a discrete point on this rod, okay? And what we are, we are representing here on the slides, instead of points, uh, I'm talking about cells as well. It, it depends on the, on the kind of model that you're using. For example, here we can use both interchangeably, but um, usually you, we, we talk about the grid point at the center of the cell, or you talk about the, the whole cell when you do computations like with fluid dynamics. It, it, it's a detail that you don't need to worry about on this example. Okay, so now every single point along this rod needs to be labeled, right? And, and uh, I label for every single point as an integer, right? And then the, the continuous, for example, the X values along the rod is gonna depend on, on the integer that is labeling the, this, this point, okay? So basically uh, you have X at a particular point that is labeled by integer i, and this integer can assume different values, right? For example, i equals to zero represents uh, a point that starts here, right? Uh, on this position x uh, left, let's say, okay? When i equals to zero. And then i equals to uh, 100, let's say, if you have 100 points, uh, you would represent a point, would label a point represented by x of i. So this pen would be like 12 centimeters, for example, right? X equals to 12 centimeters. So that's how you label the points along the grid. Usually we use the notation I. And the neighbors, the, 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 um, the neighbors on the right or the neighbors on the left, usually is referenced by adding one integer or subtracting an integer, okay? Uh, and the reason that uh, the neighbors are important is because I cannot represent or uh, the derivative in one point with information only on that point. The derivative, once you do a Taylor expansion, you can reorder the, when you do a Taylor expansion, for example, uh, um, from the, on the neighbor point with respect to the, this point here, the central point, you can find, uh, uh, 
uh, the Taylor ex expansion terms, and then you can reorder them such that when you represent the derivative, the continuous derivative, you have a sum of different terms with different weights, right? For example, here, I use minus two times the temperature at this point I uh, in order to compute the, the, the derivative. And I use only one times the temperature at the neighbor, neighboring points to compute the temperature at the I point. Okay, so this is uh, what is necessary to compute the temperature, to approximate the temperature. You can work out uh, this kind of approximation by just doing the Taylor expansion. If you do the Taylor expansion of Ti plus one with respect to, to the point I, and then you, you compute this, uh, this expression, you can find that this is gonna be roughly the, the second order uh, derivative of the temperature with respect to the X, okay? plus an order term that is gonna be uh, squared of the delta x. The delta x is the, the difference in space between the two grid points or the two cell centers of the cells. And it's gonna be order of delta x squared. Of course, if you want this computation to be more accurate, you should involve more points, right? And then you should involve not only the, the first neighbors, but the second neighbors as well. They are labeled by these numbers, i plus two and i minus two on the right and on the left, okay? Uh, the pictorial way of representing this approximation is called the stencils. And basically we just uh, write these circles connected to these rods and then add the, the, the weights of each of those circles uh, that is just basically representing how much each of those neighbors are contributing to the computation of the derivative at the central point, okay? Uh, okay, now in terms of notation, uh, for example, the time derivative or in respect to T at the point I, right, is gonna be just the difference of the, the temperature at this particular time level that is represented by the index N minus the temperature on the previous level that is represented by N minus one. And at, this, at the point, uh, uh, or the index i divided by the, the, the time step in the temperature, so in the time step in, the, in time, okay? The same sort of uh, approximation here for the, um, for the spatial derivatives, but now you, you take the time step, uh, you take the, uh, the, the length step along the rod, so it's delta x. Delta x is just the difference between the, the, the x uh, of i and x of i minus one in a uniform grid, okay? So this is a uniform grid. We're not gonna complicate anything here. So basically I'm just introducing this, a little bit of physics and a little bit of uh, um, computational uh, numerical uh, discretization, right? Just uh, for you to have a taste of a real application of a scientific application in, in, in the field of physics and engineering, right? And uh, yeah, it's just for you to, to get a taste. You don't really need to know all, the, all these details. It's just for you to have an appreciation of the difficulty that it is uh, to do this kind of computation. Uh, and, and, um, and also uh, for you to have a problem, a concrete problem to work with in which we have to communicate the points between the boundaries, right? So in, the, in 2D, you have this stencil here. It's just the same Taylor expansion, but in different directions. And the boundaries is that the, it is the main problem that we need to deal with, right? For example, we have uh, the, the grid cells or grid points lay, laid down here from one to five. It is where we want to compute uh, our um, uh, solution of the temperature in the rod, let's say. However, the stencil that I need to use to compute the temperature at one, will need information on the left and on the right. However, on the left, we don't have any point there. The domain just finished. We just have what is called the boundary condition. We need to, to set a number there such that this can be computed uh, on the first uh, element of the array, okay? So this 
is introduced to help us compute the derivative on, on the first element of array and on the last one on the on the array. Okay, it is called a guard cell. Here we have one guard cell on each side, and in, in two dimensions you have the same because the stencils now it's it's basically a cross, right? So the, to compute the, the temperature at the corner, you need the information at this point and at that point. Okay. I'm going to skip this because I think I, I mentioned the main idea that is uh, you need to, uh, to decompose the domain across the nodes and you need to pay attention on what kind of variable you're going to decompose because you want them to, you, you want this decomposition to be such that the communication between the domains in, is minimized because moving data is expensive, basically. That's the message of this slide. Guard cell exchange. So basically, now you want to decompose. You have, uh, um, let's say, you have an array that will have uh, you have a rod or an array of points that will have uh, ten points, right? One, two, three, four, five, and then six, seven, eight, nine, ten. So you want to decompose. Send this to one one task. One MPI task will deal with that. Another MPI task will deal with this with this part. However. When you, you need to compute the derivative on this point five, you're gonna need information at the point six. So they need to exchange that information. You're gonna use a send and receive, right? So the first point on the right uh, task needs to send what is the information that they have there, what is the data that they have there, what is the temperature that they have there to the guard cell of the, um, of the process of the task on the left. And the same thing, the task on the left that, that is computing this, uh, the solution on this array, you should send the, uh, you should send what is the, the, the data, what is the value of the temperature on the, at the end of the domain to the guard cell of the task on the right, okay? So I hope this is clear. It's fundamental for you to understand that in order to uh, parallelize the, the code. Um, okay, this is, um, we're not gonna do much of the 2D diffusion problem. I just want to re-emphasize that um, the way that you, you can uh, decompose the domain in 2D or even in 3D is uh, very uh, flexible. So you could invent whatever you wanted to do. However, if you do like a big blocks and small blocks, you might be uh, forcing some tasks to work harder than the others. So you wanna do this in a way that uh, make all the tasks do the same amount of work or close to the same amount of work, right? And on top of that, you need to do in a way that decrease the communication, right? So for example, if you look at this kind of, uh, uh, decomposition and count the edges, like one, two, and times three, six, three, times two, six, plus six, 12, the, you see 18 edges, right? So the data that needs to be exchanged here is gonna be, let's say 18 double, right? If you do the same here, you're gonna see uh, six times five is 30 edges, so 30 doubles. So the communication on this kind of splitting is larger. Then on this on this kind of on this kind of decomposition, so it is easy to program uh, this way, and usually that's how you see the on, on the web or on the examples, right? But in production, you want to do this. You want to keep the ratio of the surface and the volume uh, low, right? You want a, a big volume for a, a small surface in order to minimize the com communication and maximize the computation that your, your, each task will be done, okay? And in 2D here, it's, it's gonna be like the serial one, just the, the let's say the, the last point here on the Y direction, right? The last row here is gonna be uh, sent to these guard cells on the, on the bottom, right? And the first row on the bottom in green are gonna be sent to the guard cells on the top here. 
okay? So it's very similar to the 1D, and that's the reason that most of the examples you, you find around is gonna be using this kind of decomposition. But in production, don't use that. So the problem uh, that I ask you to do is to uh, look at the diffusion equation, uh, the diffusion uh, serial code, uh, and then you you parallelize that. You basically, basically you're gonna do a domain decomposition. Um, uh, uh, you do a domain de decomposition of the of, of the of, of the domain, of course, uh, and then figure out uh, where they each domain starts and ends, right? and exchange the guard cells between the domains as you evolve and do the computation. I'm gonna go over uh, the diffusion code quickly so you, you are more familiar with that. I, I'd like to ask if it is okay, the, the font size, or if you want a, a little bit larger, please let, uh, let me know. Okay, if it is too small, please let me know. I can just do one more and see if it's better. Okay, so basically um, you have a domain. You, this code solves the diffusion equation in one dimension. It's basically looking how the temperature is changed with time uh, and uh, along a rod, a metal rod, okay? So basically here we define the simulation parameters, the total number of points that I divide that rod, I divide my, my, my line, right? I divide my line in a thousand points. So I have a thousand grid points. On the left, the position, the X value is minus 12. You could think about 12 centimeters, 12 meters. The units is, is irrelevant right now. On the right is uh, plus 12. Kappa is just the, the coefficient of diffusion. Don't worry about it. We set equals to one and then uh, N step is the number of steps. So you're gonna uh, uh, march forward in time, a hundred thousand times. Plot steps is uh, how often we are gonna uh, plot uh, into the screen, uh, the, the, the solution. So here we set to 50, every 50 time steps, we plot one snapshot of the solution. Here is just the, the, uh, uh, the, the definition of the pointers for the data structures that we, we are gonna need. Uh, we need a one dimension array for X, two dimension for temperature, and one dimension for the theory that is basically, this is, um, I mean, the good idea, the good thing about the diffu this diffusion equation that is very simple, you can solve analytically in a closed form, uh, and then you can compare this, the numerical solution that we are doing against the closed form and, and compute the error, right? So basically that's what you're gonna encode here. Those are the parameters for the initial temperature distribution. You're gonna be just, it's gonna be just a Gaussian. So basically this is the, the original amplitude and this is the or, original sigma that you can, you can think of uh, basically as, as, uh, as the, this, the, the, the the standard deviation of the Gaussian, right? Uh, okay, there's a question. Why is domain decomposition sometimes called graph partition? Uh, Matt's calls are called graph partition tools. Uh, I think it depends. Uh, I'm not familiar. I, I know about Matt's and, and Scott, but I'm not familiar exactly what they are doing. I think it's, it's, uh, it depends on the kind of grid that you have. Right, uh, maybe if you have a, a grid that uh, it's un unstructured, right? And, and uh, okay, I'm just guessing the solution. I don't know exactly what they are doing, right? But I think it's it's uh, you know when you have graph, um, each graph if if each node on that graph can can connect to other nodes in the graph in a very complex way. So I think there is. Uh, some sort of uh, uh, discretization, uh, some some sort of like grid or some sort of mesh that is uh, it is uh, 
it is done or, or it is performed on the on your continuous domain with this idea in mind like basically some sort of a graphing or, or maybe some sort of a finite elements right a, a, and then uh, you can use uh, those uh, those graphs in 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 and uh, and basically cut different uh, um, parts of those graphs, different parts of those graphs, and send them to different uh, different uh, uh, different tasks to do the computation. Uh, so yes. Yes, basically, I think uh, that's uh, what Marcel is saying. It, 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 it's a different way of uh, uh, lay down a mesh or a discrete mesh uh, on the spatial on the spatial point. Basically, okay. So we can talk about uh, 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 grid points. We can talk about grid cells right grid points for example the diffusion equation is is convenient uh, grid cells is actually used more for finite volume kind of um, equations like uh, fluid dynamics where you are more interested on the average on every single cell uh, and then you have uh, finite elements where on each element you, you have a geometric form that um, you define a basis function inside those elements and and then represent the the solution as as a, as a um, as a combination of those base functions inside those elements you have spectral elements as well that represent the, the discrete solution as a infinite series of functions of base functions inside each element as well and you have graph you can map uh, the spatial domain and somehow into this graph with some sort of information. Uh, you have what is called Hanoi, uh, I forgot the name, I think it's Hanoi discretization as well, that might be using this kind of, uh, of graphing in order to uh, lay down the mesh on the domain uh, for you. So yeah, it's a, it's a field that is extremely large um, and depending on the problem that you work on, if it, uh, it, it's going to require different different kind of discretization. If your domain is simple, there is no geometric, uh, there's no weird geometry like uh, I don't know a kink or or, or 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 the edge of a wall or something like that. Then usually just uh, 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 discrete, uh, just uh, like grid points and grid cells are enough. But if you have a complex geometry, like in the airplane uh, or, or, or a wall or a pipe, uh, then usually people use uh, more uh, complex mesh uh, uh, representations of the discrete solution. Okay. So yeah, I hope I hope I sort of answer your question. It's not exactly I I don't know exactly what Matt Matt is Scott is doing. I can look it out and then we can come back uh, later on this. Okay, let me just uh, uh, go ahead with the, with the, with the code <clears throat> because I think this code is going to be very helpful. You're going to use this code to, to, to do the, um, the parallelization. Then I, I think it's, it's, it's nice that you understand a little bit better. So A and sigma is just the, the amplitude and the standard deviation of the initial Gaussian and the, the Gaussian that is going to be evolving as we, we march in time. Uh, fixed left amp and fixed right amp is going to be just the, the values of the boundary conditions that you're going to do. Old and new is just a way to represent what represent what uh, uh, it is uh, the, the, the data at the new time step and the data at the old time step. This step and I is just like a loop indexes. Uh, don't worry about the red, gray, white. It's just to, to show the solution, the graphics. Time represent times. Dt is the, is the time is the time step. Dx is the space step or, or the spacing between the grid points, and they are computed like this, right? So you have x right minus x left over the total number of points minus one. That's the the, the, the spacing, and dt you basically use like this. Dx squared times the kappa and divide by 10 um, to, to make sure that it's uh, 
it is a stable margin forward. It's just to make sure that the Kuhan condition is, uh, I think it's Kuhan, yeah, the Kuhan factor, the Kuhan condition is, is satisfied. Then you allocate the data to make it easier. We already allocated with the ghost points, with the ghost, uh, the guard cells or ghost points or ghost cells. It's uh, the same nomenclature. Uh, I mean, they share the, the, the same, the same concept with the different names for the theory for x temperature temperature at the time uh, at the old time and the new time okay and here we do uh, the setup the initial setup of course x start from x left and then you march over the grid points the temperature with the gaussian here the original gaussian the original gaussian for the theory and the in the boundary condition the left and the right uh, don't worry about the PG plot stuff. And then we here we march forward as we go from step zero to the 100,000 number of steps. And uh, for for the temperature on, on the on the left and the temperature on the right, we keep it fixed with the value of, of the boundary condition as we march. And then compute the new temperature with the forward Euler formula that is basically written explicitly here for each grid point along the rod. Mm -hmm. So you use the temperature, the new temperature at the point I will depend on the temperature at the previous time step at point I plus uh, the, the Laplacian, right? That is the old temperature at the, the neighbors and at the same point I, okay? Then you we increase the time as you march forward update the correct solution. Since I, I said we have a, a closed form of solution, don't worry about this as well. Just know that it is the solution. And compute the error with respect to the, to the exact solution in the, the, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the temperature that we just computed, okay? Once you, you compute the error, you use the, the error, the, compute the error squared and take the square root and then you uh, print the solution to screen, and then we will swap the, the level, what is new now is old, and what is old now is new, and then do this 100,000 times, and that's what you're gonna see. Uh, oops, I don't think I have uh, the Y, sorry. Oops, I think I don't see. Um, and then if I just do a diffusion, see. We just see this on the screen. Okay. Uh, new question here. Should we get the same error with MPI? My final error is different. Uh, does it show? I have some mistake as well. Yes, usually if it is, it should be the same order of magnitude, right? The last few digits being different is okay. Uh, but if it is not the same order of magnitude, then probably you have some, some error somewhere. Let me see if I can run the solution here. Yeah. Okay. Of course. Yeah. Unfortunately, the, it's not sending the the data. Oh, it opens four windows with the data. Yeah. Each process uh, open a, a, a window. So please uh, turn off the, the PG plot. But you see the arrow is uh, virtually uh, the same as without the, uh, without the MPI. 
okay? So I think I covered what I want to cover uh, slower <laughs> uh, today. So I hope it's a little bit clear. Uh, sorry that I took half an hour of the, of the time. Uh, but I think I, I should just open to questions. Uh, uh, let's start. Uh, is there any question related to what I just said uh, so far today, like about the diffusion equation or about uh, the code itself uh, or, or the problem or if you want to or if you don't understand the tips or the steps? Uh, OK, let's see here. How do you cope with boundary conditions in this piece of codes? You mean um, the, the codes that we want, the, the boundary condition here is fixed. It's a fixed value because you know the value of the theory, right? And then you're just gonna put fixed. Uh, once you, you, you decompose the domain to make it easy, keep the, the serial part that is dealing with the boundary condition the same, right? I mean, you don't need to, to worry about the, the, the boundary condition. And you, you initially, you just fix the boundary as you are fixing to that particular domain. However, when you call the NPI send and receive, for example, to exchange the data, then that boundary uh, on the domain that is internal, that is a decomposed domain, will be updated. Okay, let me go back to the slides, maybe Oops. here. So in the 1D code that I just showed, you just have this domain here, right? It's the full domain with the total number of points. I think it was a thousand, though I don't recall exactly right now. A thousand points. Here. That's what you have before. Uh, and what you did in that code, you basically set the boundary conditions here and there, okay? So when you start your code, you're going to do exactly the same with your MPI code. You're going to do exactly the same. You just set the boundary condition here in the end. That's fine. And this internal boundary condition, you are going to be updating every single time step, right? Because you need to send data from this guy to that boundary condition and from the, the task on the left to the boundary condition or to the guard cell on the right, okay? So you're gonna use the guard cells to set the boundary condition. In the domains that are in, on the interior, I mean, because you, 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 you had the initial a thousand points and then you split, let's say, here you have 20 domains, each one, or 200 domains, each of them with five points, right? Then you, you're gonna have uh, uh, this, uh, guard cells being the, in the interior of the domain. So you're just gonna exchange the points on these interior guard cells and update that as a boundary for this uh, internal interior uh, domain. Okay, is, is that clear or, or what, what do you do you wanna? Okay, yes, they are there, they are there. Uh, let me show you again then. Yeah, for example, boundary condition as we mark. So you have an e initial boundary condition, right? The fixed left temp, right? Uh, sorry. Yeah, this is the, the, the initial setup, right? That is along the whole domain. This part here, can you see my cursor? I'm gonna move it slowly so you can paint, okay. So this part here is dealing with the initial conditions. Here in the whole domain and here is defined what is the boundary condition as we march forward. And then we go here in the evolution, we set up the boundaries at this point. Okay. So good. In what conditions should we use NPI instead of OpenKey? 
Well, let's say, let's say that your code uh, is, in, is a small, your, your domain, your problem is small enough uh, to fit in one compute node, okay? So I would recommend that you use OpenP. Basically, you just start doing the profiling of your code, see which routines are the bottlenecks or the most expensive ones to, to compute. Probably it's gonna be some loops most of the time. Uh, and then you do the OpenP fragments on those loops, okay? And the good, the advantage of using OpenP in this case is that uh, you can do, um, you can do by parts, right? You choose one, let's say one, one loop to parallelize, and then you, you put the fragments there, make sure that it's working fine, and then use just two threads, and then you're gonna see already a speed up in your code. Right, and then once you're done parallelizing all the, the loops, and then you can bump up the number of threads until the overhead of uh, uh, spawning new threads is not advantages anymore, right? So that's a very good uh, advantage of OpenMP. I think it's simpler, uh, uh, faster, and then you can do incrementally as you go forward. MPI, uh, comes uh, when you, your, the, the size of the problem that you want to work on doesn't fit on the memory of one compute node anymore. Then you need to deal with MPI because you need to distribute, uh, the, uh, let's say you need to, to distribute your problem over different tasks on different nodes, right? And, and the problem with MPI, as you saw, it requires a, a lot of function calls and it requires, uh, uh, a process, uh, I mean, the process of implementing MPI is a, a, an all or nothing, right? You cannot do a partial implementation. So uh, it, it is uh, more demanding. However, the advantage of MPI is that once you implement it, it is there. And once you figure out, you, you went through the hoops uh, to try to understand and implement, you do all your drawings, uh, to see how the data is going to be communicated to each other and so on, it is there. And it, it is scalable, right? Now your problem is not fixed to, to one node. It can be two, it can be eight and 10 and 100, 1,000 and 10,000 <clears throat> nodes, right? Of course, as you scale to large and larger, uh, larger, larger number of, of nodes, then you might need to uh, pay attention to the communication patterns inside MPI and pay attention also on the load balancing. I mean, if, you, if part of your code is uh, taking longer to be computed, uh, so you need to pay attention to that and, and try to distribute the work uh, around such that it's uh, well balanced. Every task should be doing the same amount of computation. So they when they hit the communication, they are ready to communicate and don't need to wait until the other task uh, it, it, uh, catch up. Okay, is that clear? Uh, Fahad? Okay, so any more questions? Okay. Good, let me see Maddie. I'm a little confused. The error in MPI version only shows the partial error of that piece. Yes. For example, the number of tags for four, for, for rank two, it only shows the error for piece. Yes. Yes, exactly. But the, the original error uh, is from minus 12 to 12. So you need to do uh, a reduction of that error. So I think I forgot to mention that, yes, the arrow is just gonna be shown for that small piece. And I want you to reduce uh, 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 the arrow uh, and then print just on the rank zero, what is the global arrow of the solution. So maybe that's the problem that you've seen before. Okay, you can, you can use MPI all reduce or MPI reduce. OK, 
Okay. Any more questions? Would it be desirable to use NPI to break up code to different nodes and then distribute the code to different threads on each individual nodes using OpenP? Uh, yes, a lot of cases we do this. That's a hybrid approach, right? So you do the cost grain, the uh, decomposition of tasks or, or, or work, right? And then you send to each NPI, uh, each NPI task to different nodes. And then on each node, you can still uh, take advantage of threads that is lightweight. It, it has uh, a low uh, overhead, a small overhead. And then you can distribute the, the local arrays or the local tasks to each thread. So that's called a hybrid MPI OpenMP uh, uh, parallelization model, if you wish. So it's very common. Yes, you need to submit the, the assignment tonight. So and that's why I'm here uh, to try to answer questions from you as much as possible. Um, so that's basically the diffusion equation. So do you guys have any questions related to the gather and the scatter, collective, send or receive, uh, anything about the other slides that I presented yesterday or anything about the code that I, I went through yesterday that, on you, that you want me to review? Please feel free to, to do it now. So for the diffusion equation, if you are confused about the physics or the discretization, just don't worry about it. You just need to understand that you have an array that needs a, a, a neighbor point to compute some quantity. And that neighbor point needs to be exchanged between processes or tasks. And that's what you need to figure out how you're gonna use like NPI send and receive to uh, send this information to the right and to the left task. And make sure that they, they the right and the left, uh, they, they match so you don't end up with a deadlock and your code hanging there doing nothing. So that's the main point of this exercise. The rest is just context, just uh, just for you to have an idea where it came from. So Maddie, says that I used send and receive functions separately, but it didn't work, it stuck. So probably because you didn't pair them uh, correctly. Then I switched to send and receive and it worked. Yes, it's easier and it's there for, for this exactly reason. There is no loop to that lock in theory, so I'm not sure why it's stuck. Uh, well, you, you can, Share your screen or, or so Marcelo, is it possible for him to share his screen? If you want, I mean if you if you wanna show why it's stuck, we can we can take a look. Otherwise you can submit as an extra and, and then uh, I I will take a look and, and, and return to you later. So probably it is because it's not 
matched, right? Oh, you got stuck with the send receive. So you're sending, so you're sending the first element on the task to the left. And this is the tag zero. And you are receiving the element zero, one float. Okay, so it seems strange. So you are sending on the left. Uh, okay, but if you are sending on the left, the one that should be receiving is on the right, not on the left. Otherwise, this MPI send and receive will just block and, and wait for the left, but everybody's sending to the left. So basically you have this send and receive here. Oh. Yes, this send and receive here, you see, it is sending to the left and waiting to receive from the left. So it should be waiting to receive from the right. You communicate the left boundaries with the left node only. Let me think about what you're talking about. So you have the, the on the left, the left boundary goes to the right. That's right. And the other one, okay. And the other one, the right boundary goes to the left. So, but they need to match, the same need to match. It's like 67, okay, let me do that. Okay, so look at this. So let's, this guy here, right? He's gonna send to the left and this guy here should be receiving from the right. So that send receive needs to match these two guys. Okay, and then you have another send and receive where is this is receiving from the left while this is sending to the right. Yes, go ahead. Uh, hello, Verano. Hello. Uh, yeah, if you look at that red piece, suppose that that is rank two, and this is sending, it's my impression from this piece, that this is sending the piece five, this is sending the piece six <clears throat> to the left. No, 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 it's sending the piece five. Oh, you're looking at the blue one? Yes, uh, okay. or your red, sorry. Uh, yeah, I'm talking about the red one. Okay, okay. We are sending the piece, uh, number six to the yes. left yes. and we are receiving piece number five from the left. Uh, you are sending to the left. Yeah. And uh, you are receiving, yes, but they are not matched because uh, you have to th think about 
every single code is going to hit that statement uh, at the same time, yes. right? And when you hit that statement, that send and receive, this code here is going to be waiting to receive on, from the right. And then later on, he's going to send to the left, to, to the right. Okay. Yeah. So both. And this receive. code here is actually, for example, in this, let's say that the statement that you want is this, this going six here, right? Yes. So that's the MPI send receive that you want to match. So the, the, the task on the right is sending to the left this message, right? At the same time, on the other task, we'll hit the same statement, MPI send receive, and that task should be actually uh, expecting to receive from the right. Oh, okay. I I have more. I didn't copy the whole code here. I have the code for the right side, which is exactly the same for the left side. But uh, this is the code for my right side. You can copy it to to the uh, text editor. Actually, this is the rest of the code. I'm handling the right side separately from handling the left side so yes but that's a that's a, i think what is the problem because um, your send and receive is not going is not going to be matched right you're going to end uh -huh. up with a situation like this let me go back to uh, what is that? yes you're going to end up with a situation like this. Everybody's sending. Yes. Right? In those, and in the same statement, uh, everybody's waiting to receive oh. from the left. But actually, who is sending is the person on the, on the right, right? Oh, okay, okay, I got it. All right. Okay. Yeah, I, I know it's very, very confusing. And I suggest to you to draw. And even if you put the code like, uh, you know, like you could think about, okay, this is your code. And then you want to do this for two processes, just for your, your head to make an, an idea what's going on. Put the two codes, uh, one beside the other, you know, on the screen. A, a, and then imagine how you're marching from one, uh, how you mash the two code, the two tasks uh, together, right? I think that might be easier to visualize and understand what I mean by matching, right? Right. Uh, because it's it's very confusing. I I, I agree, but uh, the good thing is uh, you just need to do this once. Once it's done, it's done. Yeah. Uh, my it's assumption good. was that the only deadlock is happening something like in slide forty-one. That's the problem. I was not thinking that. Slide. Uh, slide. I didn't assume that the slide even 37 can cause a deadlock. Yes, it can. Oh, okay. Thank okay. you. Okay. So, I mean, I think you're going on, on, on the right direction. Uh, just uh, draw a little bit more and, and, and think that uh, whoever is sending the other one that's will be receiving from the from the left or from the right, right? The right send and the, the, the other one receive from the left, and that needs to be paired. Thank you. No problem. Okay, uh, any more questions? Okay, what would be the best approach for doing the Neumann or more complex type of boundary condition? Uh, that's a good question. Well, you could do uh, 
you could use some sort of like a one-sided stencil. You could increase uh, the boundary size uh, and then use the, the information that you have on the previous points to compute some sort of uh, a wave or propagation that would affect uh, uh, those boundary points and then use that for the next time, time step. Uh, you can do this uh, by uh, computing a more complex kind of uh, stencil for that region, right? Where you take into account the speed of the propagation of information uh, around those pointers, uh, around those, those points. There, there are some, I mean, my background is uh, numerical relativity. Uh, if you can, if you, if you have heard of Einstein toolkit, uh, toolkit, okay, or cactus. Uh, so Einstein toolkit is basically what is, what, is, what, is, what is called a thorn in that cactus. A thorn is basically a model. So Einstein toolkit is a, a collection of modules, right, on that. And they do have their uh, boundary uh, module where they implement all sort of different uh, complex uh, uh, boundary conditions. If you wanna take a look on how they implement, uh, I can send you a link or you can just Google for this uh, Einstein toolkit, cactus, thorn, maybe put a boundary. And then you can see what kind of boundary conditions they implement, how they implement. So you can implement Neumann, you can implement the the one that is mixed with, uh, with, uh, with the derivative and, and, uh, and the, the variable, right? And, and there are ways of doing this and depending on the equations that you wanna solve, right? If it is some sort of a wave equation, you can do this kind of a, uh, uh, propagation of information to compute what would be the proper boundary condition there. Of course, as the boundary conditions become more complex, it, it becomes tricky uh, to get a stable code. So you need to really understand what's, uh, what's, uh, what's going on on those boundary conditions and how you're implementing up to the depth. Yeah, but usually you, can, you could use some sort of like a, a sided, uh, uh, let me show you. Oops, sorry. You know, the stencils, for example, the stencils here, uh, I remember in my, in my PhD, one of my PhD projects uh, that I did was actually to derive a stencil that would take into account only points to the right, such that I don't need to have a guard cell, right? You could do that as well. It is uh, complicated. And when you're taking a uh, sort of Neumann uh, kind, of, uh, kind of stencils, you might have, you might have to do something like that. So the stencil that won't have uh, points to the right for the boundary on the left, and the only points to the left on the boundary on the right, okay? If, if you want more references, uh, send us a, a, a message on support at Synet, and then I can look it up some, some reference for you uh, uh, to look at. It. What, is, what is your background? For, for what kind of uh, equations you try to solve? Jay, can you hear me? Okay, computation fluid dynamics. Okay, so yeah, there's the literature is huge. It's huge on how to, to implement that. But it, it is a sort of a solved problem. Are you writing your own code?
Okay, so any more questions, please feel free to ask. Bruno, this is Joshua. Is it okay if I use my audio to ask a question? Yes, yes, it is. Okay, thank you. Um, my question is with the scientific MPI exercise that we're doing. Okay. Um, I understand that when we're looking at, I'm, I'm trying to convert it to MPI to, to add a paralyzation. And yes. the question that I have is, um, I imagine like for a simple case, I could create all of my variables and then scatter them to the different processors and then do the work. But if I imagine this was a very big problem, I wouldn't be able to generate all those arrays because they couldn't fit in memory. So yes. I would have to create them individually on those processors. Yes, it's locally. Locally. So uh, I guess my question is, is that the approach that you recommend that we generate it locally or do, we, do you recommend that we generate uh, and then scatter? No, I recommend that it create locally because uh, I want you to have a sense of uh, when the, your data doesn't fit uh, in, in one node. So create the arrays locally. So basically use the, the 1D, the diffusion equation, and instead of uh, working with the total number of points on doing those computations, on creating those arrays, you basically use a local number of points. Figure out what is the local number of points that you need for each process, right? Um, uh, make sure that the last, the last uh, task, right? I mean, if you divide the number, the total number of points by the size of the communicator, right? For the number of, of uh, tasks, uh, the, usually it's not going to be an integer, right? An exact integer. So, so let me say, let me rephrase this. Usually you're going to have an integer plus a remainder, right? What I'm saying is that then all the, 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 the pieces <clears throat> will have basically the same number of local points except for the last uh, task, which you have to adjust to include the, the points left, uh, the, the remainder of the division between the total number of points and the size of the communicator or the number of tasks that you have, right? So please uh, use the, create the arrays locally. You don't have to modify the serial code that much if you think about it. It's just figuring out uh, how to go from the total number of points to the local number of points, right? And then you modify the loops to loop only over the local number of points. Uh, and then you add the, uh, you initialize MPI, of course, and then you add the statements to do the send and receive uh, on the left and right and right and left. So is it is it clear? Yeah, I think so. I'm. Uh making my way through bit by bit. Uh, I guess my second question is what you just last mentioned, the communication of the guard cells. Yes. Uh, if I think about it, if I have, if I, if I only decompose into two processes, then I would have guard cells on the far extreme left, on the far extreme right, but I don't have to communicate those because they're constant because they're boundary condition. Then exactly. I only need to communicate guard cells at the interface between the two processes. Yes, that's true. But then and if I have three, then I have two interface between processes and then two. So I'm, I guess my question is, the communication only needs to occur over the interior interfaces. Yes, exactly. Um, remember, so then is, I mean, to simplify your life, figure out who is the left and who is the right of every single process before, um, uh, before using that as an argument of the send and receive. The way that we have done here, let me see. Yes, I mean, I'm not saying that, no, no, this is periodic. Let me see. The, yeah, for example, this this one here that we use this a special value, right? MPI prop new and so on. You can think about uh, um, doing the same. You figure out who is the right and who is the left in advance, and then you use later on uh, 
on the right and the left. And you can have also tag right and left as well to help you. Uh, but instead of using separate send and receive, you just use one send and receive to uh, make your life easier to match the send and receive for you. Okay, so your concern is, is good, is valid, but I would say once you take care of uh, uh, who is the left and right and use an MPI proc, no. So when it hits the, the, the extremes here, uh, the MPI send and receive will not send to anywhere, right? Because it's MPI proc no, and will not receive from any. You're not concerned about this anymore because you already dealt with this. And then you just have left and right to think about it. Okay. Yeah, it, this is helpful. Okay. Thank you. Any more questions? Don't be shy. Please keep asking. We have still 20 minutes, I guess, and we can even go a little bit longer if you need to. So did anyone try the scatter and the gather problem? If you want me to review that problem, I can go through that as well. That is a simple problem. Oh, can you send me to this dialogue? Because I have two, I cannot see the other message on the, I don't see this. I cannot see that message, uh, unfortunately, because of a technical problem that will be easily solved when I upgrade my OS. Sorry, can you send uh, to, on this chat here? You probably, because uh, I don't see anything here. So what is, what is exactly the problem? You, you can use your audio if you want. If it was a permission problem, Oh, you need to, to put the location that you want to. Missing destination. So you can put just a dot like this after that. Do a space and dot. You go to scratch, CD scratch, CD dollar scratch. And then you type that command as you type here but then you put a space and then dot, it's gonna copy on that, uh, on the scratch directory. Dot is the current directory, uh, Linux notation. Yes, the permission denied is just for, uh, I think, two or three files. Those files are the solutions of the problems that I posted. And I don't want you to, to look at those solutions yet. Uh, tomorrow, I'm going to change the permission. 
and then you're free to look and inspect and, and try it out on your, on your own, okay, compared to, to your code. Just take note of those uh, files, or the, the, the path of those files, and then tomorrow you cut over, uh, make sure not to overwrite your own work, uh, copy over, um, copy on the name of your work elsewhere, or, or say my work or whatever, and then copy those files to the directory that you did your work, and then you can compare them. There are some tools that um, you can use to compare that I find very helpful. Uh, you can do either a GIF-U or a Vim GIF. Oops. Two. So you can do like Vim GIF. Uh, file one, file two, and then you're gonna see in the screen the differences highlighted between the two codes. So that might be helpful for you to compare the solution against the, your own work, okay? Just make sure not to overwrite your own work when you copy this over tomorrow, okay? Why on the code do we write here MPI and then again MPI. Why? Okay, this uh, because the MPI uh, uh, function uh, calls it returns an error message if there is an error number, an, a number that's an error. If there is any problem, however, the library nowadays the standard is not uh, fault tolerant. What I mean by that is that if there is an error the MPI library will identify that one of the process crashed or there was a problem and will terminate all the process for you. So there's no uh, resiliency. There's no way for you to see, oh, this have a problem with the library. Let me try again and let me use this, this arrow here and then handle the MPI fault and then maybe relaunch that uh, executable at this point or whatever. There is no such thing right now on MPI. So this is just in preparation for the future. They are working on the standard uh, OpenPI 4, and hopefully they will have a, a, a robust uh, fault tolerant uh, uh, service from the library. A, 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 and then we, this error that is returned uh, will make sense. So right now we just, we just don't use it. Maybe you, you could use to, um, to print a message on the screen if you have an error. It might, you might have the message or you might not because MPI collect all the messages to, to send to your screen, uh, your, your current screen. And if there is a problem, uh, probably that message is not gonna be transmitted. So right now, it, it, you might use, you might not. In Fortran, you have to use because it is part of the argument, but in C, it is up to you. I, I, I leave those zeros there because uh, once the, the standard is upgraded and I don't need to do anything with my code anymore besides just trying to handle those errors. Okay. Okay, so we still have 10 minutes or more. It depends on you. Okay, how do we submit the assignment? My assignment, the, the boss is just not found. Okay, let me see if I can go there. Do I have a, let me see, yes. I don't have a file, okay, here. Oops, no. This guy, yeah. Sorry, too many, too many, no. Oh, yeah, and 
yeah, it's scale. So you go to assignment dropouts. Oh, it's not showing. Sorry, too many monitors, too many screens. Sorry, let me just try to find. Give one moment. Oops, I don't know what's happening. Yeah, I don't know why my browser is not working here. So let's try this version here in Firefox. Okay, so you at home. Oh, I need to be logged in. Sorry. Let's see if we can do that. So you go to your assignment Dropbox. And then you, you just add that. I don't know how to do this as a, I mean the instructor, so I might have seen different things. But in, in, in any case, you just go to assign Dropbox and then you, 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 you should be able to submit there. Yes, yes, Marcelo. So just wondering in slide 24, I can go back there. Why does it show for hello world from test? Three. Uh oh, I think it might be a typo. We can just run that code and let's see. I think it's a typo. It should be probably should be three. Uh, John D, I think it's three. I can just run that code easily, quickly here. Why I'm not seeing it? Uh, this. I think it's in PI, it's in PI intro. What was the message here? Yes, it's, it is a title. Oh, I have to put the label sign. I'll fix that. Thank you. Okay, let me see the other questions. Okay, so no more. No new questions. I hope you could submit in the Dropbox uh, your assignment.
Okay, is MPI all reduced? Is going to run only on rank zero? No, all of them is going to run MPI all reduced. Okay, so remember, uh, MPI it's a collective operation. So every single uh, task needs to every single task on that uh, communicator needs to call MPI all reduce in order to uh, for MPI read all reduce to work. Because if you don't, then your code is just gonna hang because of this requirement. Every single task on that communicator needs to call that MPI all reduce. Okay, and so and what what's and that will just reduce do the computation in one and then distribute again to everybody else what is, what the solution is. Okay. Remember the NPI, uh, before you do the MPI all reduce, you need to compute the, what is the local quantity that you want to reduce, right? So just remember that. And all of them is, it needs to do the, the computation. Okay, I want to confirm that all the nodes run the same code, right? Yes, all the nodes run the same code. And the way that they distinguish uh, themselves from the others is by querying uh, the MPI library uh, with the communicator that they have, what is their rank? So who am I, you know? How many of me, how many of us are out there, right? And so you use that information to figure out who is your neighbor, for example, who are the other processors that you need to communicate with. So all the, code, all the nodes run the same code. I just should note that this is not necessary for MPI to work. You, you can have some heterogeneous kind of jobs where different nodes might uh, run different codes and uh, but uh, they have to match uh, their statements in terms of the communication in order for them to communicate inside that communicator okay so but for this problem yes every single uh, task is running this exact same code and they need to distinguish themselves in order to do the their local computation Any more questions? So if you happen to have more questions from now until the time we submit, please post them on the forum and uh, we are going to be monitoring and uh, and i hope uh, to be able to answer them before you submit uh, your uh, your assignment okay and the gather uh, assignment is optional but i hope you have also some time to to try it out just so you have a little bit more experience with mpi okay so if there's no more questions, then we should uh, just uh, stop here. Any last minute questions, please? Uh, the gather.c, uh, this here. Oops. On the collectors, what is that one that? Yeah, this one is optional. 
Okay, you take a look at the scatter code to see how it works and then reverse the process on the gather.c. Yes, the main assignment is not optional. Uh, the main assignment is a diffusion equation. You have to MPI uh, instrument with MPI and solve it and do your best uh, to, to, to get it a correct solution and submit that. This is optional. This is just extra work that you can do uh, for practice in a better understanding how MPI works and a little bit more of uh, of uh, experience in using collectives. Uh, yes, in the, in the usual summer school format, we go over these problems uh, uh, in, in, in class, right? So you have a lot of time to do. But here is a, is a shortened version of the summer school. So I'm not gonna stress this uh, on you. So you give it a try <clears throat> on this one if you can. Otherwise, don't worry. Uh, there's going to be other, other MPI uh, workshops in the future in, we, in which we can go back to these problems and work them out again and slowly and, 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 and so on. But right now, focus on the diffusion. That's mandatory. And this one is just optional. OK? Uh, I'm not sure. It depends. Probably yes. I don't have any plans to go back to the to, to work uh, place uh, anytime soon. Don't want to be part of the second wave. Yes, there are a lot of our courses uh, have recordings, usually workshops, so we don't because there are some idling periods where we have, we wait for people to do, right? And it's not nice uh, to have that recording, uh, but we might, we might change that in the future, given the, 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 the current circumstances, right? Yes, it makes it possible to participate. Yeah, but I think Marcelo can talk more about uh, the different requirements. So if you're doing, uh, yes, a restricted university course or not. Marcelo, if you want to use the audio, please go ahead. Hi Bruno, thank you. Yes, I just want to mention that some of the courses may be restricted for uh, students enrolled in the university, but other than that, everyone is welcome to see it or access the material. Everything is open and online, so it shouldn't be a problem. But in some courses, like the long ones, like the ones that take the full semester or half semester, uh, priority and restrictions are applied to enroll your students in the university. I hope that that, that is clear <clears throat> to you. Any Canadian university? Any Canadian? So it could be it could be any Canadian university. Uh, it's easy if you are in Ontario uh, because there is a mechanism for actually allow you to take courses from different universities in the in the province. But if you're in a different province, there may be a mechanism or an agreement between U of T and, and your university. So what I was going to post in the chat is the email 
so that you can ask questions if you have any questions about that. Um, I'm not sure of Carleton, but um, we, it's something we can we can ask around. Uh, the earliest that you let us know which course are you interested in is is uh, better for us to to check with the authorities. Okay, if there is uh, any more questions, please feel free to ask now, or we should just stop the, uh, the office hours and then we monitor the forum to see if there's any other questions. And please remember to submit your assignment before midnight today. Okay. So thank you for coming and asking questions. It's part of the learning process. Yeah, see you tomorrow. There's a wrap up when I'm gonna go in over this, the solution again. <laughs>